my name is Amanda Kelly. I am a histotechnologist. I've been a histotechnologist for about 30 years, uh, 20 of which I've been a, in management or part of a management team. And uh, so I've been in all aspects of histology, including veterinary. I've also been involved in uh, research histology. And um, I'm also um, currently involved in a hospital uh, environment, which is why this became very important to me. So today we're going to talk about the impact of coronavirus in the histology laboratory. So let's see, what is a virus? Well, viruses tend to be uh, made up of RNA or DNA. In this case, the coronavirus is made up of an RNA-based virus, and it is attracted to an ACE2 receptor. That ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is an epithelial-based um, receptor that is located in your respiratory system, in your nose, in your, your airways, in your lungs, and all throughout your respiratory system. So it's an in, inhaled type virus. Um, it is named corona because it looks like a crown under the microscope, as you see in your slide. Virus, this virus originated in animals and was transferred to human. There's some um, speculation as to whether or not it went from bat to pangolin or bat to snake. They're not exactly sure the route in which it made it to humans, but we do know that it was an animal host to human host that caused the viral transmission to, uh, to mutate um, to become person to person. So the virus is spread person to person and currently there is no vaccine. All right, so there's many type of coronaviruses. Uh, you may know, know coronavirus is a common cold, and uh, most people have had that at least once throughout their life. And a few years ago, there were some really bad versions of the common cold, SARS um, and MERS, um, which are a version, which Coronavirus is a version of SARS. It's SARS-CoV-2, so it's a novel uh, SARS. It was previously unknown up until December 2019 of this year when it was discovered in China. It is a small molecule. It's 120 nanometers, or if, you know, for histotex, 0.12 microns. Um, coronavirus may be uh, spread, when it's spread person to person, it has to be spread in by a viral load. One of them may not make you have an allergic reaction or may not be asymptomatic. It will take multiple copies of that viral load, so it's a matter of time and exposure that gets you the virus. So it's very important to limit time and the amount of exposure that you have to keep from getting COVID-19. It's easily transmitted via aerosolization. So if it's um, like once you, know, you sneeze, you project that sneeze through the air unprotected with a mask. Or if you cough, you'll, you can spread it out in, into the air in front of you. Surfaces around you that where you cough and sneeze will become contaminated and can linger. So if you sneeze and then someone behind you is running and they walk through that sneeze cloud, they can get the COVID, which is unfortunate. And even though it's a fast collection because you're running, uh, you may inhale a lot of uh, virus, which could get you uh, contaminated with the uh, disease. So symptoms tend to appear within two to 14 days of exposure. And symptoms range from none, some people are asymptomatic, to severe respiratory illness, which requires hospitalization. And those that uh, get severe respiratory illness, um, it stimulates cytokine storms in those vulnerable individuals, which means it overactivates your immune system because of the replication of the viral um, component. And how that virus um, uh, replicates is during attachment and penetration of the virus into your cells. The virus itself attaches to that host cell and injects 
its genetic material into it. Then during the uncoding, replication, and assembly of that viral DNA or, uh, or RNA, in this case RNA, it incorporates itself into the host cell's genetic material and induces it to replicate the viral genome. So it's causing your body to go, oh my gosh, and it replicates that virus. It's using you to replicate the virus. And so, of course, when it does that, it's, it's really difficult for people to handle that are high risk. And, and the virus um, is, has a high death rate. Um, it's 1% to 4% compared to a much lower death rate for something like uh, the flu. And that death rate is totally based upon what's going on in your, in your local environment. Like if you lived in um, a third world country or if you lived uh, where in, a, in a rural area where your access to, that, uh, to medical care is not as good as someone who lives next door to a large hospital complex in, in say in Detroit then um, you're not going to have the, uh, the medical care available to you immediately to be able to help you get that treatment. So you, you have to be able to understand what the symptoms are so that you know the difference between just regular symptoms and emergent system, symptoms. So symptoms, um, you expect to see fever or chills, a cough, and it's going to be a dry kind of cough, uh, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle and body aches. Some people say that those are stabbing when they have them. Uh, headache, it's also true that some people say that that, that headache is stabbing. Uh, the loss of taste or smell, and we found uh, in research that just came out a few days ago that that loss of taste and smell are relative to the amount of ACE2 receptors that just happen to be in the nose, which is one of the common ways for which uh, coronavirus can enter your system. Sore throat, uh, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting, and then uh, of course diarrhea. Now the emergent symptoms uh, that you, the, these are emergency warning signs so that you have to seek medical care like immediately. Trouble breathing, uh, that persistent pain that we were talking about that just won't go away and pressure in your chest, it feels like somebody's sitting on it. Uh, you're confused. You just don't know where you are, what time of day it is. Um, you have an inability to wake up, stay awake, so you go in and try to wake your person up and they won't stay awake. And they have that bluish cast to the lips or face, which means that they are, are not getting enough oxygen. So they need to be helped if, uh, immediately. Now, if you have an oximeter, you can buy an oximeter at the, the uh, Walgreens or one of the local pharmacies. And those oximeters you can use to help uh, monitor how badly those emergent symptoms are. And if it gets anywhere past 95%, uh, you need to be going to the hospital. And I know 95% oxygen saturation sounds high, but it shouldn't be that low. So you want to get there before it gets really, really um, bad. So moving on, uh, the prevention of transmission. Uh, the best way to prevent transmission would be not to be exposed to the illness. So how do you not be exposed to the illness? You practice social distancing. So anywhere over six feet when you're talking to people, uh, you wear a mask, you um, use pickup and delivery for items, especially if you're over a certain age uh, population or within that risk population. You avoid uh, close contact with others with who you know that are sick. And uh, you be very careful in a public space not to linger around people that you hear that are coughing or even if they're wearing a mask. So just kind of quickly leave that area and move to another area. Uh, prevention or transmission of, uh, for, uh, to prevent the transmission, you want to practice good hygiene. You want to make sure you wash your hands for 20 seconds, sing the happy birthday song, or um, you know some other song that's important to you for 20 seconds so that you make sure that you 
wash your hands completely. After touching door handles and any other common spaces used, especially in the histology laboratory, because you have changes of shifts in 24-hour laboratories, so you'll want to make sure that you clean off those bench tops and the microtomes between people. Because what if the person, because um, occasionally people, you know, they get tired of the mask and they'll take the mask off for a moment. They might have accidentally contaminated that area or their hands when they did that, when they touched that area. So make sure that you disinfect your area. And then before and after using the bathroom, sounds like common sense, but I know some, several people, you, you know, you've been out somewhere and people are in a hurry and they forget to do those things. Avoid touching your eyes or nose, and uh, especially when your when your hands are gloved or you're working near the the uh, grossing stations. Just be really careful that you don't try to to adjust your mask or or check your glasses or you know if you get splashed. Be very careful to not just immediately touch your face with your dirty gloves or or unwashed hands. Um, Clean your computer tops and everything around your area because you're going. Most people now use electronic means to uh, print their slides, so make sure that you disinfect those areas between people. So getting deeper into the histopathology laboratories, there are several places where it uh, directly affects histology. The facilities, um, that would be the engineering and ventilation, things you don't really think about but uh, need every day. Your PPE, how often you change your PPE, how you put it on, how well you, um, you, you change, uh, you disinfect your area between shifts, and then the regulatory uh, aspects of it, what CAP is OSHA and CDC is demanding that you do within your laboratory. And then there's going to be what your HR wants. The HR is going to be different in every place. And um, most places are going to be adhering to those OSHA and CAP and CDC regulations so that they don't get in any kind of uh, trouble. So potential safety impacts to the histology laboratory. So for safety, um, you should wear the appropriate PPE for the appropriate uh, bench. And then um, staff, if you can, I know how tight it is in most histology laboratories. And if you can social distance and move your stations um, six feet apart, then do so. If you cannot, then make sure that your PPE is appropriate for your level of distance that you'll have to um, maintain, like you may if people are within that six feet distance, you might want to put the plastic covers over your face as well as uh, the mask. So, uh, just, and then put your lab coats on over your uh, regular uh, scrubs so that you're not worried about um, accidentally um, contaminating your neighbor. Um, room air exhausted outside, hopefully, or is recycled through HEPA filters. There are um, portable units that you can purchase that will continue to clear the air and they are quite handy. Uh, there's some in my reference um, section in the, in the end of this, uh, this presentation. You can use the references to locate some of those uh, products. Um, negative air pressure to surrounding areas. Now that is true for some laboratories and, it's, and sometimes it's not true. Um, the ventilation exchanges that you are supposed to have for your lab is between 6 and 12 per hour. Um, you'll have to ask, you're most likely this is something you, you're not going to know. You're going to have to ask either your facilities or maybe your supervisor would know how many air exchange per hour. But the higher that number, it's that, that time factor that we're getting into, your time of exposure. So if someone is in the lab and is asymptomatic and doesn't know it, um, they could be uh, exposing everyone else. And if that's true, and if your air exchanges through those HEPA filters are fast enough, then your air is being filtered out relatively quickly. 
that is what they're doing on the airplanes now to keep uh, people from getting um, COVID in, um, on the airlines. Your eye wash and hand washing stations are cleaned and supplied. Make sure that you're not, nobody's touching those with dirty hands or make sure that if you sneeze or anywhere near to the eye wash station and you accidentally had your mask off for a minute or you're changing masks, because sometimes you're brought in, you came into the lab with your cloth mask, but now you have to put on your surgical mask, and say you sneezed in between. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would go back and get a, a, a fresh surgical mask, and second of all, I would make sure that I cleaned that area where I sneezed, and make sure that uh, that um, you you do a, do it so that you aerosolize some um, alcohol to make sure that if there's anything hanging in the wind, you will have at least cleaned that area off with some aerosol um, alcohol. Um, staff should have their temperature taking daily. That's an HR thing. Some places uh, will be doing that normally because that's what the CDC recommends. Some places will not. Some places small, like uh, maybe small derm labs that may only have just the doctor and the, the, the technician may not feel they have to have that or in some rural areas. But I would still do it just uh, just to make sure that you're okay and that uh, that you didn't come in contact with something that you you didn't didn't realize you did just in case you know um, that uh, you have children at home or or that uh, or you're taking care of elder adults that you don't have to worry about yourself so much. And you should always have yourself checked if you run a temperature to make sure that, because there's other stuff out there besides COVID, but right now we need to make sure that um, it's not coronavirus. And then, like I said, disinfect things often. And notify your supervisor if you're sick, because that, that saves the other people in your department. Now, a laboratory, a safety mitigation of viral contamination. The laboratory must uh, assess risk, risk factors, and they must decide um, exactly if there, if some of the recommendations that WHO, CDC, NSH, or CAP has um, actually applies to them. You know, like for instance, in Derm, you may not ever have any kind of lung tissue in your lab. So as far as exposure to those kinds of tissue, it wouldn't be the same kind of level as a level one trauma center where you've got multiple levels of people who are um, sending you know, um, cytology bottles of BAL downstairs that are, may, may possibly be loaded with uh, COVID. So you have to do it based on the risk factors for your laboratory. Um, wash your hands frequently and social distance as you can. And you'll hear me say that a lot. And you'll hear everybody say that a lot because it's a matter of time and viral load. Um, wear your surgical mask and use N95s whenever you're processing cytology or on the outside chance you have to do frozen section. Now, we'll go into this a little bit more deeply here shortly. Uh, because it's very, very important that you um, take care of yourself. And then if, there, if someone is positive in your laboratory, then you want to quarantine that staff for 14 days. And if someone in your family is uh, returned from a hotspot or if they have, are symptomatic and you suspect that they have COVID, I would tell my supervisor and uh, quarantine for 14 days. Multiple disinfectants of, in, of, um, of disinfectants are available, Clorox, hydrogen peroxide, and um, depending upon how light, like hydrogen peroxide is not uh, an astringent type of disinfectant, so it has to sit on there a little bit longer than a Clorox or a 70%. Um, there are laundry sanitizers that you can use at home that I would suggest you use. And you're so scrub your clothes and make sure that they are your, your scrub clothes are washed separately from your regular clothes at home. Designate one pair of shoes at work, and then I, I carry a can of Lysol 
So the, before I get back in my car, I spray the soles of my shoes, or I wear another pair of shoes home. So, but if you can't afford one, then spray it with Lysol and go ahead and get on in the car. Okay, histopathology laboratory regulatory guidelines. This is going into individual parts of the lab. CDC regulations for specimen collection, manual processing of fresh, unfixed specimens, including frozen sections, should be conducted that, in a manner that provides a barrier. You need to stay away from the splashes, sprays, droplets, and aerosolization. The specimen fixation, I've heard some literature say you have to do it for 72 hours. I hear standard is fine. Uh, do what works for your laboratory. Your, your pathologist will probably know best on that. For air dried specimens, be very careful with air dried specimens, especially if it has something to do with uh, uh, nasal passages or any lung or aspirated material. Cytology slide prep. Okay, CDC regulations for uh, cytoprep specimen would be um, for um, FNAs or suspected COVID cases, they don't want you to necessarily do it, but they understand that sometimes you have to. So um, batch your high-risk risk specimens for processing, designated to one technician, a brave technician, or preferably to a separate station, similar to what we used to do for CJD on a CJT, uh, CJD suspected case and that you use one processor for that. You can do the same thing for cytology, use one, um, you know, uh, slide preparation area for those high risk specimens and um, be careful to try to do it under a, a BCL2 if possible um, um, class uh, uh, hood if, if available. If not, uh, you might want to consider if you can share with um, micro for that. Autopsy. Now for autopsy, the CDC regulations is extensive, very similar to um, the um, CJD in that you have to wear the plastic cover over everything. You shouldn't be using the, the metal um, Cut the, any metal cutters that are electric. Um, you shouldn't be using um, any kind of, you should be using face shields and, and have to use N95 respirators. Try to make sure that your, uh, air, that your air system is really cranked up to at least, uh, the ventilation is cranked up to at least 20. It is recommended that by the, uh, con the construction people, but I know some, in some places that that may not be true, but try to find out definitely that whether or not it is because that's extremely important for your safety. Also, doors to the room should be kept closed. And then, uh, like I said, don't use an oscillating bone saw or any other kind of saw that is electric that can splatter or um, send anything flying. And then make sure that you record the names and the dates of anyone that was working on that possible COVID patient so that you can have that for contact tracing. Accessioning. Now that you got those specimens in, we'll go to accessioning. Um, accessioning workstations tend to be close. And I know they are, uh, but try to uh, distance them the best you can. And uh, because these specimens are coming in off the floor and they could be coming in off a COVID floor, have those sent down by hand. Don't use pneumatic tube systems to transport those specimens because if they're broken, um, that could be tragic in, <laughs> it, throughout the process and, it, and trying to disinfect that would be a horrible situation. So um, store those specimens and uh, I would double container them, so I put them in a container and then put them in a secondary container to make sure that when they're being transported down, especially if they're glass, like the pleural fluid um, glass containers, um, they, then if somebody drops them, it's in a secondary container, so you don't have to worry so much about it. Gross room and tissue processing. 
perform unfixed tissue dissection in a, a certified hood, it has to be a really good gross, grossing station hood. And you have to work behind your splash shield and uh, use a combination of PPE, especially if it's um, some type of a lung tissue or some type of, of uh, nose or other um, specimen that you know has been contaminated with um, COVID. And make sure that you wear N95 respirators uh, in these environments. Don't use the surgical ones. Now, frozen sections, if you have to, um, uh, try to avoid them if you can. But if you cannot, then um, receive specimens apart from the administrative staff. Um, make sure that the cryostat has a downdraft. Do not use any kind of spray cooling agent on the inside of your machine when you're working with a, uh, a COVID positive uh, case. Also make sure that you have uh, your HEPA filters, your appropriate PPE, double gown if, if you possibly can so that you, know, you can discard that top one. Make sure you have goggles on, N95 respirator again for, for these cases. And then like I said, don't use the free sprays. And, um, and it just takes your time with it. Um, I know some people don't like steel mesh gloves, but use it if you have them. If you don't, just be extremely careful. But I recommend that you do use them. And be very, very careful when cutting fresh tissue. In the, in the cryostat. Um, histological fry preparation. The good thing about um, the chemicals we use is that it tends to fix most everything. And uh, the original uh, purpose for formalin was as a disinfectant. And uh, in early histology, um, most of uh, the dissection was done barehanded without gloves because we didn't know at that time. And uh, people would just immerse their hands into the formalin when they dipped uh, the fresh tissue down into it as a disinfectant protocol, and then they just close the lid. Uh, thank, thank God for you know for <laughs> for learning a lot of new information. So uh, now we don't do that, but we still immerse our tissue slide tissue in there. So when the human tissue go in or <laughs> into the formalin, it will inactivate it, very similar to what people used to do back in the 19th century. And, um, and so those now, well, as long as they're completely fixed, should be fine. And then with the different varying um, concentrations of alcohol, that's just a great, another great step to get rid of any uh, virus and just inactivate it. So you should be fine. Our system of slide preparation should be fine to take care of any, um, no matter what the viral load is. So I would not worry about processed tissues for viral load. Histopathology laboratory disinfectants. We have a lot of common common disinfectants. We use the Lysol IC, uh, Clorox, and then Cavicide, and uh, Metrol. We have used a lot of different uh, uh, Clorox based. All of these are approved disinfectants. The only thing I would do is you keep the Clorox away from the from anything that's steel because it will pit it, and you don't want to pit anything that's uh, steel, like your grossing stations or um, or your microtomes or anything like that. So use your alcohol on those um, uh, instruments. Okay, using appropriate PPE, we just kind of talked about that. Uh, just go for your housekeepers. Now, your housekeepers, make sure that you you divide out your um, your trash so that uh, that you're not hurting your housekeeping staff when you go through this because um, you want to you want to make sure you separate your trash out so that uh, if there's any kind of blood associated blood or body fluids associated with this, you don't want to accidentally contaminate an area that um, 
that you shouldn't. So be cognizant of the people that come into your laboratory that are not histotechs, that aren't going to be maybe as diligent as you are in um, handling the trash or handling or uh, discarding things around uh, the lab or not know how to discard things prop uh, properly. Human resources and operational challenges. Now there's a lot of operational challenges if you're a boss. Uh, one of the things, uh, the biggest thing for operations is we now have to share the PPE that we have in our lab, we have to share with the rest of the hospital or the rest of a, uh, if you're in a, a derm lab or a uh, urgent care center, you have a small lab there. Um, those places, they have, they're going to have PPE shortages. And the CDC has guidelines on those um, PPE shortages as to how it relates to people being furloughed. So if you haven't been furloughed, um, then that's wonderful. Then you've never had to have a PPE crisis that forced your uh, hospital or your local people to, um, to reduce your capacity. So how, this is how they make those decisions. So for conventional capacity, that's standard routine. Everybody has normal access to PPE. So like um, for the most part right now, we have our shortages are running pretty good. We're not um, hurting too terribly badly, but we have to make sure that we have enough for the people on the floor that um, have to treat COVID patients um, at the, the local hospital facilities or, or because we're keeping them away from the doctor's offices and other places so that the hospitals become the heavy place that needs the PPE. And they may need it quickly as, you know, um, uh, one, one day we may have, a, you know, 25 patients and the next day we have 150. And so, and that could happen during this pandemic and has happened during this pandemic. So when that happens, then you, it ramps up to a contingency capacity where you develop staffing and supply strategies to handle the cancellation of elective surgery. So that's when it affects, directly affects histology. So when they start canceling those elective surgeries over in endoscopy or over in uh, the breast center or over in um, um, other parts of the hospital, maybe they're not, send, maybe they decide not to send uh, so much of the ob -GYN specimens over. So this limited, or even some of the cancer, depending upon, um, you know, um, the contingency capacity stress, they may be coming, they may be canceling those elective surgeries. When that happens, then um, that is a direct impact to our lab. So human resource wise, you may suddenly not have any specimens. So yesterday you had 1,000, today you have 500. The next day you only have 100. And uh, so what do you do when that happens? Well, it's a crisis PPE on the floor. So they shut everything down on the floors or in the urgent care centers. So now it's an operational challenge for the HR person. They had crisis capacity for PPE. They may come downstairs and say, hey, can I have the rest of your, your um, lab coats? Can I have the rest of your uh, surgical masks? Can I have the, the, they may come down and take everything you have, and then they may reassign some of your techs to, you know, um, uh, some people were cleaning masks for the floor. Some people I know were also, um, they were uh, taking temperatures at the front door for people uh, coming into the hospital. They may reassign you to other positions until, um, or you know, in lieu of furloughing you. But sometimes they can't help it, and they have to furlough you. And um, and usually it's temporary. And uh, they usually let um, your um, unemployment company, you know, of your state know that this is happening, and that they intend for you to come back. And so that um, when you apply for unemployment and other assistance, 
your job basically guarantees your job that you're coming back to your job that this is a temporary furlough and usually when they give you that they usually t give you a target date for return and, um, and so that's uh, that's good then sometimes um, it uh, they have to after once you get that furlough back and that date comes sometimes some people are are uh, temporarily laid off and um, also because of that and because of they're trying to conserve PPE they will limit visitors coming in and so if you haven't been furloughed sometimes they have you standing there taking temperatures or turning people away you just stand there and tell them nope sorry can't you you can't come in today you know we have to to limit the access to the facilities because of um, high COVID. <clears throat> also, uh, human resources. And I know this is difficult. It's kind of like the flu shot. Asking people to do something personal that, uh, in a professional, um, in a professional situation, that you need for your job and that's hard for people sometimes so there's some people that don't um, want to take the flu shot there's some people that don't want their temperature taken every day they don't want to have to record this uh, you know symptoms but a lot of companies um, have, and hospitals and urgent care centers now have a way for you to record those uh, electronically before you come to work it is the honor system, and uh, some places don't have the honor system. They'll ask you at the door. Still, it's, it's, it's up to you to give them that uh, uh, information, and I'd like, to, like to, to think that everyone is being honorable when they, when they do this. And then if you also honorable when they just decide to stay home if symptoms do develop, if you have a chronic cough, Please stay home. If you have uh, a fever, and that, um, then please stay home. If um, you know you have any symptoms that you think are relative to COVID, please get tested uh, to verify whether or not um, you have it. Sometimes it's available at your installation, but most places now um, it's easy to get tested, even uh, for free. And then um, OSHA guidelines should be strictly adhered to on the reference page in the, one of the last pages of my of the handout and of this presentation. You will see a list and a link to all these things: the CAP guidelines, the OSHA guidelines, because they're very long. They're 20, 30 pages, and it's difficult for me to synop you know give you a synopsis of that in an hour. So I recommend that you go through the references. Check out all those links and go see those places so that you can see what's actually going on. So that when they, when uh, someone asks you why you know we have to do this and you don't have to ask a thousand questions, you can find out for yourself why these things happen and why you had to do them. This is a stressful time for everybody. Be courteous to your coworkers. You are on this crisis together. You know, everybody, I, I know it's tough. I know it's hard, but um, this is coming from me as a, as a manager. Um, it's, it's harder on your coworkers, your manager, and if, if you're constantly stressed and constantly complaining and, and upset about, um, about the crisis, it's better to be well-informed. It's better to, like, take that last page and, and take a look at it. Don't just be afraid and act out out of fear, uh, because it, it, it's an easy way. It's an easy thing to do. It can happen to anybody, and because of that, that's why I want you to think about it when you're when someone does um, get too upset, because they could have a person at home who is exhibiting symptoms and they're afraid, and they don't want to talk about it. And um, so try to to be courteous to one another, and then um, let your supervisor know when you plan to take a vacation and your and your coworkers, because a lot of times when you take a vacation, when you get to the vacation, you may find out that you have to sit there for 14 days before you can actually take the vacation. Then you may find out that you have to once you get home, 
take another 14 days before you can even come back. So prepare well if you're planning on taking vacation. If you do, I would plan short vacations and locally where you're not really leaving the area in which you're, you're used to commuting or if you do not too far away from so that in that you won't have to subject yourself or others to the 14 day quarantine because when that happens it can put real stress on your coworkers and on your supervisor to try to get other people in because um, if they have to get a, uh, a PRN or other person and they may not want to expose themselves to a new PRN environment. Now there's a new set of people. There's uh, people they don't know. And so they may not want to come. And so now you've stressed the department. And you didn't mean to. You know, it was just you just wanted to take vacation and go out of town for a little while. So be, be cognizant of that when you go. Contact where you're going so that you know what's going on. Um, also, um, let's go to skip for a moment. Let me go back. Check on employee mental health. Um, sometimes people are very, they very, they get very upset about things, and you don't, you don't know if um, you don't know what you don't know. So as a supervisor, you may have to furlough or eliminate people, and they will get, you know, they they will get very upset because it's more adding more stress to more stress to more stress. So when you have, if you have EAP available, please, you know, um, make that available and let your staff know that EAP is available so that they have someone to talk to. Because that's important. That's really important to take care of your mental health as well as your physical health. And then, um, um, Use Zoom and other telehealth, telemedicine alternatives to meet with clients, clinicians, patients, vendors, some of those people that you would normally maybe uh, they would w drop in to meet to meet with you in the laboratory, and then uh, modify your in-person group meetings. Like uh, you don't want to put everybody in a single room um, for your group meetings like you used to. You may want to. Um, um, have smaller meetings with the shift. Um, I know that's difficult on the supervisors, um, but um, you might want to either even make a Zoom meeting to where they stop at a particular time, and then you can talk to them from home instead of trying to talk to your staff um, live. Okay, so that was the last one. So we got uh, any questions? 